what what about the differences in these in these um, clocks with yeah. respect to the you know the the original Horvath clock you hear mm -hmm. about versus the one that you um, developed with with uh, your mentor Steve Horvath mm -hmm. in, with respect to um, phenotypic aging phenotypic yep. age clock a grim age like what are what are some of the major differences in those clocks in terms of their predictive power. Yep. Uh, so the original clocks were used. So when you develop these clocks or train these clocks, we, we use machine learning. So we're usually trying to predict something. So you take all your methylation data and you say, how can I predict whatever this is? And the original clocks use chronological age. So the idea is, can I look at methylation and predict someone's chronological age? And so again, that's kind of this idea of you have the pattern of someone who's this this age. But we know, again, chronological age is an imperfect proxy of this process we're actually trying to quantify. So what the second generation clocks did, the one that we published in 2018 was the first example, is we said, oh, can we come up with a better thing to try and kind of tune these measures to? So in that case, we used kind of normal lab tests that we combined into a measure that was predictive of mortality. And then we trained a predictor of those lab tests. And similar thing was done with the Grim Age clock, where they took these different uh, proteins and they trained predictors of that, and then trained the predictor of mortality. So we think that something that captures mortality or health span or kind of physiological decline is going to be a better thing to tune these clocks to than just chronological age. Mortality risk um, is, is a big one that you see uh, with like grim age and even mm -hmm. I think pheno age as well. How how does that like how well do they predict mortality risk and even disease you know specific mortality like your cancer mortality risk or your mm -hmm. in, how do they compare to to like a frailty risk or a frailty index mm -hmm. measurement or something like that where you know you can you can also measure mortality risk. Yeah, so they're they're actually pretty powerful when it comes to mortality risk. And I would say right now, Grim Age is the best in terms of predicting all, what we would consider all-cause mortality. So basically, any mortality risk um, all combined together. Um, Grim Age is particularly good at cardiovascular risk mortality, which is why it does well at all-cause mortality because that's the biggest uh, killer of people, uh, at least in the United States. Um, but I think in terms of predicting more specific types of mortality that someone might be more or less at risk for. I think this is where you need more of these systems measures. Um, but they are pretty powerful at predicting kind of remaining life expectancy or all-cause mortality. Of course, they can't predict who's going to get hit by a bus or whatever. But in terms of kind of population averages, are you more or less likely uh, than someone else you're with the same chronological age to have early mortality? They're actually pretty good at that. What about in young people? So it, it's really mm -hmm. fascinating because, you know, like I, when I think about mortality risk, I think of like an older person going in, doing a battery of tests, getting all their blood work done and, you know, trying to do their grip strength and breathing mm -hmm. to do that, you know, and I think about, so I think about more of like things that are being measured and, and aggregated together to come up with this frailty, frailty index. But for someone who's younger, like in their 30s, like, and they go and do all this stuff, like, I don't know that it's really going to be a good predictor mm -hmm. of their mortality. I mean, they're young, mm -hmm. you know, they've got pretty good lung function. They're, you know, you know what I mean? So yeah. is this where grim age may mm -hmm. shine? Like, can, if, you, if you have a 30-year-old or 25-year-old and they do their grim age, mm -hmm. does it, like, accurately predict mortality risk? Yeah, so we don't have these really, really long follow-up studies, but at least the preliminary data seems that it's going to be much better for young people because exactly as you said, these functional things are going to have what we consider either a floor or ceiling effect. So for most people below some certain age, they're all going to perform well on it. They're not at a level where they're seeing dysfunctional decline yet, which goes back to this idea of biological age versus functional age. Um, Whereas the epigenetic clocks are meant to capture more of this biological, molecular, cellular aging that we think will eventually feed into that. So if you can say, oh, you're aging faster at a molecular level than we'd expect, we'll also expect you down the road probably to have these functional manifestations earlier, even if we can't see them yet. So I, I totally agree. In younger people, when these things haven't really emerged, this is kind of the only way to kind of proxy who might be heading in that direction.